everybody, and welcome to our Medical Minute. This is a continuation of our special series on ASCO, A Patient's Perspective. Um, today, we have Dr. Douglas Johnson from Vanderbilt University, where um, he leads their melanoma clinical research uh, program. And so as you could guess, um, he's going to dig into some of the abstracts that were presented at ASCO this year. Um, Dr. Johnson? Well, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks to Dr. Lemming and the rest of the Cincinnati Cancer Advisor teams for having me. Um, there's really three different abstracts I'd like to hit. And by abstracts, I mean sort of presentations done by the physicians and scientists at ASCO, which is our big clinical oncology meeting uh, this year. And hopefully this will be helpful um, when thinking about how melanoma is treated. So the first is a study of a drug called pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy drug that's given to patients with stage two melanoma. So we've tended to think about treatment for many different kinds of cancers when it becomes metastatic, when it spreads to the organs and so forth. But what we'd obviously love to do is prevent it from ever happening in the first place. And so what this study aimed to do would be to take patients with high risk stage two melanoma, basically melanoma that's really thick and deep and ulcerated, uh, but has not spread yet, and it's been removed by surgery, and to take that group of patients that's at really high risk of the melanoma coming back, and then giving this drug pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy drug, to try to prevent it from coming back. And so the good news is it actually was quite effective in that um, in that context, where patients uh, with either uh, you know various different types of stage two melanoma, depending if it was very thick or whether it had something called an ulceration on top of it, it basically reduced the risk of the melanoma coming back by about 40%. And what was also really nice is a lot of times my patients will ask me, okay, well, by coming back, what do you mean? Is it going to come back on the skin? Is it going to come back in the lymph nodes? Is it coming back in the organs? And so the good news is with this study, it actually prevented all three of those. So it prevented coming back locally and prevented it from coming back in the lymph nodes and prevented it from coming back in, in the organs as well. And like I said, it did that by about 40% decreased risk of, of recurrence. So it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't prevent every reoccurrence, but it does meaningfully reduce the risk. And that's true, thankfully, now that we know in both stage two melanoma as well as in stage three melanoma, which means where it's spread to the lymph nodes and, and the surgeons have, have removed it that way too. And I think Dr. Lemming and I both have, have been very uh, interested in seeing some of the developments also where we talk about something uh, more of a pre-surgical treatment, uh, which, is, which has come to the forefront recently as well. And this is an approach where basically we give a couple of doses of immunotherapy even before surgery. So again, the paradigm previously has been if you've got a disease that could be taken out surgically, you go ahead and take it out and then you give treatment afterwards. Well, in this case, you can theoretically, you can think about giving a couple of doses of immunotherapy, then take the tumor out and then give more treatment afterwards. And what this seems to do is almost give a, a target for the immunotherapy to work on. If, if you think about it, if the tumor's out, you're sort of hoping that the immunotherapy is able to sort of figure out what to go after. But when there's an actual tumor in place, you can almost like train the immunotherapy to work, then get the tumor out and then have the immune therapy clean up the mess, so to speak, afterwards. And so it turns out that when, when we have the option to do that, when there's a, a tumor in place, like a lymph node or something like that, it seems like it actually works better to give the treatment before surgery rather than just wait till after surgery. So that's also been a recent development. It was not presented at ASCO, but was presented earlier this year and recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of our bigger uh, abstracts. Um, Dr. Newing, I don't know if you want to add anything or, or anyone well, else. Um, sitting to my left, your right, um, is our local expert and our CCA medical director, Dr. Philip Lemming. Um, and he is kind of our local um, melanoma guru. So um, the big thing with this pembrolizumab study and the fact that it was treating patients 2B and 2C, can you break that down a little bit for for the patients to explain kind of the difference and why this was was a big deal when previously we were only treating stage three patients before? Just sort of similar to earlier times when they everybody thought very thin melanomas uh, were of no concern and they found that there was a, 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 a population that had high risk. And what was found was that there was a population of thick melanomas that had negative nodes that actually did not do very well and actually could be as high of a risk as uh, stage three node involvement. And, 
and there was no uh, FDA-approved treatment for that uh, at the time. And this study uh, opened that door to be able to help people that would not otherwise uh, uh, be offered uh, treatment into, uh, as the study showed on the original report and the follow-up, it, it actually uh, seems to be even do, doing better uh, the longer these patients are followed up. Yeah, perfect. Um, now, obviously for patients, it's not just about the treatment options that are out there, um, but also the potential side effects that can go along with it. Um, Dr. Johnson, do you want to touch on just um, the the data and what came out of, of this study in regards to percentage of patients and, and what the side effect profile looked like in this study? Well, that is a great point. It's certainly something that I think both Dr. Lemming and I think about pretty strongly when we're thinking about advising patients on what kind of treatment to take and whether to take any sort of treatment to prevent the, the cancer from coming back. Is these immune therapies cause what we what we think about as something called immune related adverse events? So these are very different kinds of side effects than regular traditional cancer chemotherapy. You know, we don't see hair loss, we don't see nausea vomiting very often, we don't see uh, low blood counts and so forth like you would with chemotherapy. Instead, what we can sometimes see is the immune system can sort of be triggered and. I would kind of, I kind of consider it as, uh, you know, misfiring, so to speak, where basically the patients can have inflammation in their own organs from, from treatment. Now, the good news is that's usually very manageable with some steroids or with holding the treatment or giving other supportive care. Most patients can do really well and, and recover from treatment. However, occasionally there are very severe side effects. The colon can become inflamed, the lungs, uh, the heart, even the brain, you know, very rare side effects, but, but really can be significant. The, the number I usually quote to my patients in, in, you know, from not just this study, but from a variety of studies is that somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of people will get a more significant side effect, depending on how you measure that, that will require high dose steroids to calm the immune system back down. So it certainly is very important to think about. And I think it's also important to talk with your doctor about, uh, you know, for anyone who might be in this situation, what is the risk of this melanoma coming back? Am I in a, you know, real high risk group that I really would benefit from treatment? Or am I in a little bit of lower risk treatment group where maybe I can think about, you know, holding off on treatment now, but maybe, maybe getting treatment later. And I do think the side effects question does come into play when, when people are making those kind of decisions. And, and also uh, having some side effects actually may predict for a better response. Very true. Yeah. yeah, certainly some of the skin side effects uh, specifically. Uh, yeah, totally agree. It's a sort of a marker that that the immune system is reactive and um, and attacking the cancer. Um, you know, hopefully you don't want too severe side effects, but a little bit sometimes can can show you you're 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 having some activity. It's always it's always fun when you know, somebody comes in with a, you know skin rash and are some mi minor uh, 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 autoimmune side effects and. We look at them and say, oh, that's great, you know, and they look at you like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I haven't been sleeping and I'm stopping at every corner to scratch my back, yet you think this is great. <laughs> they, and, and what I do explain to patients is that although we joke and, and we get excited about seeing some of their, those side effects, there has actually been data presented and that shows that patients that develop the rash, especially early on, do go on to have a better response to treatment. So, you know, we do not, um, we do not giggle in your misery. Um, we, we really just are looking for those patients who we know are going to have a good response. So, so that covers the pembrolizumab um, in adjuvant um, stage 2B and 2C. Um, now, let's talk about the um, nivolumab um, plus relatinib, um, the relativity study. Um, it, let's jump to that in the um, looking at patients in the metastatic setting. So patients who have had their melanoma and it either presented with um, already spread disease or um, it was removed and then came back. Yeah, so this is a very important study. So this is for, as you said, patients with stage four melanoma, patients whose disease is spread to the organs. And essentially, the, this study compared two different treatments. So first was a drug called nivolumab or Opdivo, which is very similar to the pembrolizumab drug that we just mentioned and talked about as a single drug immunotherapy. And it was combined, it was compared with, excuse me, the nivolumab plus a new drug called relatlimab, and it's actually given as a, as a single infusion. 
And, and basically, this new drug, relatlimab, works a little bit like the Optiva or Trudo, basically where the uh, it, it sort of activates the immune system in a slightly different way against the cancer. And so the good news here is that the this combination was actually associated with a better outcome compared to the to the nivolumab alone, where basically you have about an 80% less chance of, of, of progressing uh, and, and, and likely even uh, dying of the disease as well. There also seemed to be improvement there. And this was actually very comparable to another combination treatment that we frequently use called, uh, called uh, the, that's a combination of a drug called ipilimumab and nivolumab, but it also seems to have less side effects. So this is a you know, really a new treatment option that's that's been around just for the last year or so. And this this study basically looked at longer follow-up. So now that people have been on treatment for about two years or so, or, or even off treatment, but have, have started treatment at least two years ago, and there seems to be a, a continued improvement in outcomes for those for those folks. And so this is a really important treatment option now for patients that does have better outcomes, but also a potentially favorable side effect profile, at least compared to some other treatments that we have. Perfect. Now, we do talk about that um, side effect profile. And um, obviously, with these patients, you see, you know, there's an increased risk of side effects when you combine two drugs compared to one drug alone. And anybody that's worked in the melanoma space, um, when they've worked with um, ipilimumab and nivolumab, um, obviously, the biggest concern was the the side effect profile. And, and Obviously, when we talk to patients, that's that's a big stressor. Um, with the combination of the nivolumab and the relatinumab, um, what do you what are you seeing? Well, it, the the study did seem to indicate there was a you know a reasonably higher grade three four toxicity uh, in this group. The the patient the the question I guess always it, that uh, we all worry about is. When, when talking to patients about going from one drug to more than one drug or uh, things that then add more toxicity, you, you look at the numbers on, scan, on uh, the studies, but you know, how do you determine for a person, how do they determine the value to them um, of adding another drug uh, uh, and with a little higher side effects? And, and how do you present that in you know, discuss that with people. Uh. Yeah, I think this is, this drug makes it even more complicated. We used to have two options for folks in the metastatic setting, either the single drug, either nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or we had the really intense option of nivolumab plus ipilimumab. So, you know, you can think about side effects for the nevo ipi, you're talking, you know, an eight to 10 on side effect level, but also much more activity. Whereas the single drug, you're probably talking of you know two to three. I don't know what scale I'm using here, but you can uh, you know much much less side effects. With the with this new combination, you're probably talking about not quite as much activity as the nivolumab and ipilimumab, although that's that's still something we need to figure out over time. But you're seeing more in the middle type of side effects, so it's kind of an intermediate option with you know probably more activity than the single drug, but less than the nevo ipi, but also similar you know less less toxicities, but um, than, than the combo, but more than the single agent. So it's it's sort of a, um, you know, do, do patients want the, you know, the more intense option, the least intense option, or the middle of the road option? It's a hard decision. Uh, I think it's something that we all are still wrestling with, honestly, um, to to think about what's, what's really the best option. And as you said, it partially comes down to patients, uh, individual patient decision, you know, how, how, what other medical problems does the person have? How is it, how is the side effect if it happens going to affect the patient and their overall health? You know, so it's, it's, you, we really do want to make an individualized patient decision, but sometimes those are not always straightforward. But in, in, in summary, it sort of offers you a two drug option that is a, is a little less toxic than the other. Two drug light. Yeah. Two drug light. <laughs> yeah. It is nice though, because before we, just like you said, we only had the two ends of the spectrum. We had, we had Single agent immunotherapy, which is a good option for some patients, but might not have as great of a response rate, but has a lot less potential toxicity. But then you, there was nothing in the middle. And then you you jump to Ipinevo and you're looking at, you know, it's not if you're going to have a toxicity, it's when. And and we were like hunkering down because we're prepared that it's, it's probably going to be pretty significant. 
So it's nice. Um, patients might not realize it until they're they're you know sitting in the gun site, but it's nice to now have a middle of the road. You know, for those patients who don't have a significant tumor burden but do have metastatic disease that you'd like a little bit more than just single agent drug but you aren't quite sure you want to pull the cannon out with it be nevo so yeah. um well and then putting that perspective if, if you go back to when we all started many years ago the <laughs> five-year survival of metastatic melanoma was less than five percent and and if you if you look at the curves uh, even on this study you know, we're, we're, we're talking about differences, you know, in people that are still living with, uh, with, uh, without disease, you know, a number of many months and maybe years. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're talking about toxicity, but they're still alive. Yeah, it's amazing. The, you know, the, the, the seven and a half year survival with ipilimumab and nivolumab now if you just look at the melanoma specifically, because of course, um, you know, there, there are other medical conditions and other reasons that people can, can pass away. If you just look at the melanoma specifically, you're talking 55%, seven and a half year survival. That, and like you said, that compares to less than 5% 10 years ago. So, you know, really remarkable progress. And, and my, my suspicion is that the, this new combination is probably not going to be too far off that as well. It, it definitely is is exciting opportunity for melanoma patients because it, it's been in my career that we did not have a lot of options for treatment. And to see the changes that have come just in the last 10 years has been significant. Um, but that's a good um, kind of segue into our one of the hottest topics in melanoma at ASCO this year. Um, I think, was it Jeff Weber that presented it? I, did he present uh, it? He pre I think presented a previous time. It was a, a, yeah. a, a yeah. talk from Australia who presented it this year. Yeah. yeah. I think was, Jeff presented at AACR, I think. That's where it was. So um, regardless, the data is still the same, and so is the study. But if you want to um, talk about the Keynote 942 trial. Yeah, so this one, as you said, has is, is gotten a lot of media attention, a lot of uh, excitement, uh, justifiably. You know, one of the holy grails that we've hoped to have for many, many years has been a cancer vaccine, you know, something that we could give to somebody and the cancer would not either never get cancer or it would not come back or somehow leverage the immune system to attack the cancer that was already there. And so this is a study that basically looked at a somewhat similar population to the one we talked about for the first abstract, and but this was patients with stage three or, or resected stage four. So these are patients that melanoma had spread, but the surgeons were still able to get it all out. And so what they did in this study was actually design a personalized vaccine for the patients. They basically were able to sequence the tumor um, and basically use some you know complicated bioinformatics techniques to basically predict which proteins would trigger the immune system the most aggressively. Uh, and they could do that for up to 34 different proteins. And so basically this was a tailor, tailor personalized vaccine uh, for every single tumor. And then what they did from there was then randomize people to either pembrolizumab, again, we've talked about pembrolizumab a lot uh, in this time, or pembrolizumab plus the vaccine. And so what was found is that this was not a huge study. This was, uh, let's see, uh, somewhere around uh, 250 patients, uh, not, not a huge study, uh, actually more like 200. Uh, but basically the group that got the vaccine had significantly less recurrences of their melanoma. Um, and interestingly enough that all of the benefits seem to be after the sort of nine month range or so um, after the study starts. So that, that was also pretty interesting too. It's we've seen a few early studies with these kind of approaches in the in the metastatic setting. So when the tumors have spread, you know, and it's it's um, my impression that data is not not that it's not real active in that setting. So this may be the the opportunity to use cancer vaccines to basically when it's high risk, the cancer's out, uh, and you can use it to prevent the cancer from coming back. And the data about it not really working in the first few months that to me supports that in that you could say, hey, the, ca the cancer that was going to immediately come back, there was already some, some significant microscopic cells. It's probably not going to work as well. But the patients uh, who it's going to come back late, uh, those are the ones who is really going to benefit. So th this was, um, I guess, Moderna that uh, was involved in the uh, COVID vaccine and that same sort of technology. And, and I, I, I think 
some what people had the idea that MR, the mRNA vac- vaccine technology was like a brand new discovery, but it's been actually around for a long number of years. So, so what, what excitement going forward do you see the uh, the the concept of tailored uh, vaccines, and where do you think it might might head? You know, next. Well, I, you know, I think certainly there's there's ongoing studies and and plans. Well, certainly there's a, a, a plan to do a, a large phase three study, because I will say there there the one caveat to this kind of study is that it was still fairly small. So with a small study, there's always the possibility that it could be chance alone. And so, you know, we certainly don't hope hope that that's not the case, but but we do need a larger study to confirm. So that's certainly one, you know, major need that is actively being conducted and planned. But the hope would be here that that this is not something that's specific to melanoma. The hope would be that, you know, this could be used in lung cancer and bladder cancer and kidney cancer and many other kinds of cancers, especially those that seem to be active to the reactive to the immune system, but maybe even cancers that aren't very reactive to the immune system. Maybe this is a way actually to make them more reactive to the immune system. On on the um, on the study, you know, and going through the presentation that was at ASCO, one of the very last slides that was on there uh, really caught my attention about the, even as a small group of patients, about the potential significance of circulating tumor uh, DNA in regards to, um, you know, whether it was positive at the beginning or not, and the, its, its predict, pr- potential predictive role as far as what you'd expect on the outcome. What, 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 what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's that's been a one of our um, you know one of the real problems with using any kind of more preventative treatment or post-operative treatment is figuring out which patients actually need therapy, uh, and that's that's a real challenge that we all have uh, because some patients are going to be cured with surgery alone, and so you'd love to be able to spare those patients any kind of treatment, and of course you'd also like to really figure out which patients are going to benefit uh, as well, and so. Uh, the use of circulating tumor DNA can can potentially be a, a, a useful um, marker there to help us predict which patients are going to. And certainly, the patients that had high levels of circulating tumor DNA um, or you know seem to be destined to recur um, you know without without treatment. So I think there's that was a pretty small group of patients uh, if I remember correctly. Was, you know the the numbers were sort of under ten and so forth, but but potentially pretty interesting that that this might be a marker to use. To, th- to really think about which patients to use this vaccine strategy in. We have covered a lot of information, um, three of the big melanoma abstracts that were presented at ASCO this year. And I think that we have pushed the limit of our of our time as Chris is sitting over there um, shooting me uh, numbers as far as, as how much time we've spent. So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, obviously, um, tune in. Um, for future episodes. Um, We also have um, more episodes coming from uh, more data from ASCO. Um, So we would love for you to tune in. If today's um, episode didn't uh, cover the topic you were looking for, just wait. Um, We've got more to come. So go ahead. One one comment that for for those watching uh, interested in melanoma, you want to keep an eye on Dr. Johnson. Uh, he's going to be one of the uh, phenomenal future leaders in the in the uh, science and care of melanoma patients in our country. So uh, now that you've heard him, you've heard uh, you've you've heard him before he's world famous. Dr. Johnson, thanks for tuning in with us today. You're too kind. Thank you so much. <laughs>